Hey friends, I want to welcome you to church. Uh, I want to start with a word of prayer. Let's prepare our hearts for God's word. You know, we want to be good soil to receive what God has for us and to be able to put into practice what God wants to share with us today. So let's pray together before we get into the word today. Father, we are so grateful that we get to share the word and we get to grow closer to your will and your purpose for our lives. And so I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would be with us wherever we're tuning in from. May the power of your Holy Spirit be with us in our rooms, in our homes, hospital rooms, jail, wherever we find ourselves, God. I just pray the power of your Spirit over us. Open our hearts to more of you and your word. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. So today I want to continue the talk that we began last week. Uh, it's a two-part talk on developing holy habits, right? If we're going to bear fruit, like Jesus said, right, it, it, it's going to happen because we've been intentional about developing these holy habits along the way. And so a quick recap, we talked about how when the Bible talks about the concept of soul, it's not talking just about the physical, you know, the, the intangible part of you that goes to heaven once you die. The Bible is talking about your entire being, that your soul means your mind, your body, your relationships, how you handle uh, your finances, and, and everything about you, basically, is your entire being, right? And we talked about how Jesus said that we, we must understand that if we're going to bear the right fruits in life, if we're going to produce the right things, we have to be connected to the vine because he's the vine and we're the branches, right? And he says if we remain in him or abide in him, then we might bear much fruit. And so we said that if we're going to be a, a healthy part of the vine, then we have to build these trellises for our souls because the whole concept of a trellis is that you need to lift up the vine so it's not being affected by predators and diseases that come when the vine is too close to the ground. So it's up to us to build a trellis for our soul. I want to recap from last week that this is what we mean by building a trellis for the soul. And we talked about, you know, creating margin to abide in Jesus, uh, learning to uh, renew our minds daily, right? We talked about taking care of our bodies. The bodies is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then we talked about the concept of rest, right? That we needed so much that God said, you need to rest. So I'm going to make it a commandment for you to rest. So today, I want to focus on the, on the last three parts of the trellis. Again, you got to take this seriously and build this into your weekly, monthly schedule, right? So we're going to talk about work and money, relationships, gospel, and hospitality. What I want you to, to track with me today is to, is to see how these these, each one of these areas of your soul has to do with being with Jesus and then has to do with doing what Jesus does. Because the whole purpose of this journey is to be more like our Lord and Savior Jesus and to do more of what Jesus would do. So I, I look at it this way, right? It's twofold, right? The first part is being with Jesus. The second part is about doing what Jesus does. If you're taking notes today, we're going to focus specifically on doing the things that Jesus does. And to get us going, I'm going to read from the book of Colossians chapter 3, a couple of verses uh, written by the Apostle Paul about the focus of now doing the right things, right? Here's what the Bible says in Colossians 3, beginning with verse 23. It says, work willingly of whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ, right? I love that because if we're going to build these trellises and do what Jesus does, we have to come from a healthy place. Like I said last week, the goal of these habits is not to do some, you know, obligated religious duties. The goal of these habits is actually to create margin for more joy and things that you enjoy doing and, and that you look forward to doing them. Right? So I want to talk to you today about doing what Jesus does in the areas of work, money, right? relationships, 
and also gospel and hospitality. The first thing we have to understand this is that from the beginning, from Genesis, God called us humans to work, right? That work is actually another spiritual element of who we are. Like work is part of our journey, right? We we're created to work and we were created to be good stewards of what God is trusting us with, right? Let's go ahead and define what it means to be a good steward, right? Basically, to be a good steward is, is what we do with the resources God trusted us with, right? In other words, your life, <laughs> I don't know if you look at it this way, but it's a resource. Like your whole entire life is a resource. How you spend your time, your talent, and your treasure says, I know what God has blessed me with, and I need to be the best possible steward of the things that God has trusted me with. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, God had put that mandate on humanity. Remember, the word Adam means humanity, right? From the beginning, God was saying, this is what I'm calling you to do. I want you to be a good steward. In other words, we don't own anything. We are called to be managers, right? That is a powerful way to live life because it sets you free from trying to own things, from trying to hoard, right? If you understand that you're here because God created you to be here and he's empowered you to work, then you understand, oh, I just I need to be a good manager of the things that God has trusted me with when it comes to work and when it comes to money specifically. In other words, we need to have a healthy theology of work, right? Theology is a study of God, right? We need to have a, a healthy understanding of why God created us to work because if we have the wrong mindset of work, then it becomes toxic. It becomes detrimental to our souls. But if we have the right concept of work, then it's a blessing, right, to be able to come from it from a healthy perspective. Here's a question that I would propose to you when you think about work, right? How much is it you and how much is it God, right? That's a, that's a crazy thing to think about because a lot of times we think it's all of my efforts that's producing these things. Right? But God says that you don't have anything without his blessing on it. Right? So where do you begin and where does God begin? That's the beautiful thing about mystery. That if we just learn to partner with God, then we understand, listen, all I'm doing is what God already built in me to do. Right? So when it comes to work, my friends, I think we need a combination of two things. Right? We need a combination of spirit and also of perspiration. Right? And we see this back again in the garden when God told Adam to cultivate the ground. And he says, hey, hey it's going to come through the sweat of your brows, but my blessing is going to be on it when you do it with me. Right? That's why the Bible says work as if you're working for the Lord because then the touch of God is on your work. Right? The touch of God is what you're doing and you get to enjoy it more. Right? When you know that I'm coming from a place of, a, 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 of, of, of the right perspective. So I need the spirit, but I also need perspiration because we are, we are extreme people, right? Like we have a tendency to pick either or, but it's not either or, it's both, right? The Holy Spirit is with us, but also it's going to require some work. It's going to re require some perspiration. Another way I look at it is I need wisdom, but I also need preparation, right? I can't just think that God is just going to work everything out if I'm not putting my effort into it. Matter of fact, God will bless your efforts when you know you're coming from the right place of being a steward, right? And as a steward, I think this journey, my friends, it's about living a life of simplicity and generosity, right? Like the more you can declutter from the ways of the world, which is all about, you know, give me more. My name is, you know, my name is Jimmy, Jimmy, gimme, gimme. It's about understanding that, listen, I, I do have a responsibility and a privilege to own the things that I own. And remember, I don't really own it. I'm just being a good manager of the things that God has trusted me with. Therefore, I want to be like him. We have a, a generous God, right? So why not learn to tap into that generosity and be exactly like him? So what does that look like from a practical standpoint? Well, number one thing that the Bible teaches us when it comes to our work and money is that we need to learn to honor God with a tithe, right? We need to learn that the 10% the doesn't belong to us. Actually, 100% doesn't belong to us. This is actually a test. The Bible says to test God in this. It's the only time that God, the Bible tells us to test God. It's in the area of finances. It says, listen, if you trust me with your tithe, watch me take care of all your needs. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to struggle. We're not going to have days and, and months and sometimes years of struggle. But it's learning that if I do the principle... God will always honor it and God will always bless it and God will always take care of me. So the tithe is to honor God with your money. Remember what Jesus said, right? Jesus said it's not about money, it's about your heart. 
Because he said, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. In other words, that's where your money is, right? So if we're going to have a healthy understanding of our souls, we don't want to be the guy who hoarded and then lost his soul in the process because he didn't understand the power of giving, right? Tithing teaches us how to be generous. And it teaches us how to be in the flow of God's will for our lives. And it's one of those principles that only makes sense when you actually do it. Right? Because on the, on, the, on the general concept of it, most people just think it's about money. But really, it's really about your devotion and your heart and understanding where your blessings come from. Right? The other thing that has to do with having the right heart when it comes to work and money, the Bible talks a lot about learning to bless the less fortunate. Right? That's why we call it tithes and offerings. Right? The tithe is being responsible and obedient to the principle that God put in place. The offering is actually an extension of your heart that reflects the heart of God for those who are less fortunate. Right? You cannot read the Bible without seeing that. Like it's all over. Like, right? Okay, go back to Genesis. God was always about think about the less fortunate. Think about those that you can bless. How does that look practically speaking? i tell you a, a quick example of how we do this, my wife and I, is every Friday, first thing that we do is honor God with our tithe, right? We do it every single week because that's the first thing the Bible says to do, honor God with your first fruits. Then after that, we always ask, okay, who can we bless this week, right? We, we honor God with our tithe, but then we go, who can we bless this week? We have sometimes certain organizations that we love and we have a heart for. Right? And sometimes it's just within the house. Right? It could be a family you need. Right? So it's all about being in tune with the Holy Spirit and being in that position that I get to do this. I get to be a blessing. Right? And that's, that's the whole concept of working with God, not for God or grudge, begrudgingly trying to give. Right? Because the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. And it is more blessed to give than to receive, Jesus says. But you don't know that until you actually do it. Right? So that, my friends, in a nutshell, is the concept of work and money that is going to be healthy for your soul. That you can actually enjoy your job and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Can you say amen from where you are? The next area that we need a trellis for is the area of relationships. Right? Again, going back to Genesis, God made it clear that we are relational beings. We're not meant to do life alone. Right? Again, what does he say? Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It is not good for humanity to be alone. Remember, the word Adam means humanity. So I'm going to make him a suitable helper. And God begins in that process the birth of community, right? The birth of, of relationships and the birth of marriage and the birth of family. So I want to talk to you about uh, four areas of relationship that all of us need to to create the right trellises so our souls can prosper and thrive, right? The first area is the area of friendships, right? We all need healthy friends in our lives, right? Because, again, life is so much better when you have people that you're doing life with, right? And we need to understand the power of friendship. One of the things that we saw clearly the last couple of years is how isolation is not good for us. Right? Mental health issues went to a whole other level because of lack of great relationships. We were isolated, which God said to never do. Right? But then we didn't reach out. Right? And that created a whole mess of, of mental uh, issues that came along with isolation. Again, to me, it was a great example of how not to live life. Right? Our government should have never done that to us. But that's a whole other story. Right? Let, let's stay on track here and talk about friends. Here's what I believe, right? In any one of these areas that we're going to talk about, I believe this. Every human being needs one healthy, constructive conversation a week. Like, and I don't mean just a hi and bye. I'm talking about a real conversation. Every human being, I don't care who you are, you need to have a healthy conversation with someone. Right? And when it comes to friendship, to me, is it would be great to have at least a one weekly conversation talk with someone that gets you on a deeper level, right? I'm talking about people who are on the same journey with you, people who want the same things you do, right? And maybe it's a weekly call or it's, it's let's grab coffee and really have an honest-to-goodness conversation with someone that's going to help us do life on a deeper level because here's what I'm finding out more and more. And I talked a little bit about this with our leaders in the church that 
there is this crazy research that says that psychologists are saying that the more you spend time with someone, the less you actually know what they're thinking. Think about that for a second. Right? Just because you live with someone doesn't mean you know what they're thinking. Just because you've been friends with someone doesn't mean you know what they're thinking. Or vice versa. They don't know what you're thinking. Why? Here's why the psychologists say that happens. It's because we have a tendency to assume that we are in the same vicinity than we're all on the same page. But the reality is they're saying that the longer you are with someone, the less you actually know what they're thinking because you're just assuming that you know what they're thinking. So we need to check in with each other. We need people in our lives. And that goes with, with friends. But I want to talk about four categories of relationship, right? The second one is the church, right? What is church? Church is a gathering of people who are looking to do the will of God together. Another misconception, especially among American Christians, is this isolation of church. Like I can just read the Bible on my own. I can just pray on my own. But the reality is, if you look at the way Jesus lived and the way that the Bible writers lived, they always lived in community, right? For them, it was a foreign concept to try to do church on your own, right? This is why, you know, it, it's good that we have the technology to go online. But, man, church really happens in the flesh, together, doing life together, like breaking bread, praying, fellowshipping, communion. Like all of that could be done in, in a group, right? Jesus said you have, you have to have at least two or three to call a church, right? And so for us, it's crews, right? It's small groups, it's breaking down the big church into smaller gatherings so people can actually feel like they belong. You can ask questions. You can, you can have prayer requests. You can share praise reports. You can share what's going on in, in, in your neck of the words and have people that can support you on a deeper level. And we always say, for us, the tagline of Cruz is to not do life alone. It is not enough to come on a Sunday morning. You need to be part of the, a healthy group of people. And I know that a lot of times when it comes to crews, it's intimidating because you're like, man, can I really be myself with a group of people? You will never know the answer to that until you actually try it. And I, and I think when it comes to life, we all need a little bit of a discomfort if we're going to grow. Like we all need to do something outside of our comfort zone once in a while because that's the whole element of living by faith, right? It's you got to get out of your comfort zone once in a while to see what it could happen. And this time around, we decided to do something new. I'm actually excited about it, that all in-person crews are happening on Wednesday night right here in the church. We're going to take this entire sanctuary and turn it into small groups. So like that, no one feels weird about going to someone's house, especially during COVID. Y'all get weird, all of that stuff when I get into that. But man, we've made it so easy for you to come during the week on a Wednesday night and be part of a crew. So if you don't have a crew yet, before we end service today, that is your action step. You got to find a crew. And the good thing is, if you have kids, the kids are going to have their own crews. How awesome is that? That everyone is going to have their own crews. Like you're going to come in on a Wednesday night. We're going to start with a time of hangout, fellowship, community for about half hour. And then we're going to go into crews. But your kids will be in the kids wing having crews with their, with their leaders. How awesome is that? And we have crews for everyone from kids to youth to young adults to adults to uh, more mature adults, <laughs> you know, we have crews for everyone. We don't want anyone missing out on crews. And if you can't make it to an in-person crew, we also have crews online. They're going to be meeting via Zoom. But I'm telling you, if you can make it in person, I would highly recommend you join a crew because you're not meant to do life alone. The Bible is not meant to be just read alone, right? A lot of mistakes people make interpreting the Bible is because they're doing it in their lonesome in a basement somewhere and watching weird YouTube videos, I highly discourage you from reading the Bible just on your own. You need community around you so you can ask the right questions because sometimes by yourself, you're answering all the wrong questions that you're asking. Can you say, amen, you crazy one in your basement? Get out of that basement and join the crew. The next part that is so critical is the area of marriage. Right? Again, going back to Genesis 1. It's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a suitable helper. That's when God created the concept of marriage, bringing Eve into the picture so that they can actually begin community together and, and build a life together. My friends, more than ever, marriages are under attack, right? Our world 
is deviating further and further away from what God had in mind, right? Marriages are being shunned, right? We don't really talk about marriage the way that God intended anymore. So it's so critical that God's people, we don't lose the heart of God in our marriages, right? And I just want to get practical with you about some things we need to do better in our marriages if our relationships are going to thrive and our souls are going to thrive because of it. If you're married, you got to learn to check in weekly. We need to, again, do not assume that your spouse know what you're thinking about. Matter of fact, that study says married people, this is actually very detrimental to your marriage because they're saying that we just assume because we've been with this person for so many years, we know what they're thinking. No, no, no. Actually, they're saying the, 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 the they say the, the longer you've been with someone, the more you don't know what they're thinking. We think it's the opposite. Like, oh, I know this person because we've been together. But they're like, no, you're just assuming that you know this person. So you need a weekly check-in. Because you know a whole week can go by without really checking in. Especially if you have kids, your life is busy. So it's important to have that, like, in your trellis. You need to build that in. Like, when can we check in? You know, for a while there, my wife and I decided that life is so busy, we have so many kids, that we have to be intentional about a weekly check in on a Friday. So what we started doing is we put the kids to bed, we order, take in, take out, and we'd sit. Because who wants to babysit for five kids every single week? So our date night became in-house. Like we just order, take out, and we would, we would talk and debrief the week, right? Does that happen every week? No. But we're trying to be more intentional about those moments of checking in. Again, how is your trellis? You have to figure out where does that fit in, in your in your weekly or bi-weekly, whatever you want to do it, but you have to do it, right? The second thing is, man, date night. Listen, I'm preaching to myself here. With five kids, date night is far here in between, right? But it's so important that we keep dating the people that we fell in love with, right? And if you're not married, listen, date yourself. Get to know yourself really well, right? Because you're only going to give what you have. You can't give what you don't have. But I'm talking specifically to married people right now. That is so critical that you implement date night. Like keep falling in love. Right? Keep pursuing your spouse. Make it a thing. Put it on the calendar. Because I don't know about you in my house. If, if it's not on the calendar, it's not going to happen. Right? So we have to be specifically intentional about that. And also get away once in a while. Right? Talk about work and money. Why are we working so hard if we're not going to enjoy it? Right? Once in a while, Take your spouse out. Go somewhere. Go away for the weekend. Right? Stop, stop being a cheap skate. Right? I'm talking to the fellas right now. Stop being a cheap skate. Take your wife on a weekend. And all the ladies say amen somewhere watching today. Right? So critical. Our marriages need to be strong. They need to be healthy. Right? Our romance, you need to be amazing. I believe God's people should have the best romance, should have the best intimacy. Why? Because we know and understand it's not just physical. It's emotional, but it's also spiritual, right? From the beginning, God said, I want you to have healthy relationships. So let's make sure we're investing in our marriages. And the last part of relationships, I want to talk a little bit about family, right? Again, another area that we need to really build a trellis and be intentional about spending time with our children, right? Here's something that I want to challenge us with that I'm trying to do in our own house. I want to reclaim the dinner table. Right? I think it's important to eat together. Again, going back to Jesus, right? What did Jesus do so much? He ate with others. What is the purpose of eating together? It's fellowship, it's communion, it's intimacy. It's let's talk together, let's hang out together. Nothing like breaking bread with another human being that you care about. Starting right at home, right? We need to reclaim the dinner table and have healthy conversations around the dinner table, right? One thing that we try to do from a practical standpoint you know, it's just eating with the kids and simply ask one question. Share a highlight from your day, right? Why? Because that gives us an insight into their world, right? I can't just assume what's happening with them. But from that one thing, share a highlight, we'll have a conversation about who, who knows what's happening in their world, in their friend's world or in their school, right? So I want to encourage you, reclaim the dinner table at home, right? I know it's not going to happen every night. But, man, let's do what our best to make it a thing at home. Date your kids. Right? I have five kids. Something that has been a huge blessing in our family is 
it just, it, I think it happened maybe a couple of years ago or maybe a year and a half ago. I had this idea that, man, there's five of them. It's hard to give them the best attention. So I started taking them out every single week, one by one. On my day off, on Monday, I decided, hey, you're each going to get one hour to do whatever you want to do with that. And that's been amazing. That's been an awesome thing because it's a trellis. It's part of the trellis that I've built now in our family where I get to spend one hour with one of my children and do whatever they want to do. And it's been amazing, right? Because they're all different. They're all unique, right? Like my, my two girls, uh, they're different. Like one just wants to go to Target and, and, and look at toys and maybe get one toy. The other one just wants to go to Five Below and get some creative things for artistic things that she wants to do. And then the, uh, my boys, all different as well. One just wants to play basketball. And I told them, you're never going to be dad until dad is like 85 years old because you got to earn everything in this house, right? My other son, he's the gamer in the family, right? His thing is, can we get a game? Can we play a game? And then my youngest one, um, he's a wild card. I don't ever know what he wants to do, right? He could just be want to run around the house playing Legos. But you know what? It's been an amazing thing, and I look forward to it. One thing I decided to do this season, again, I'm just giving you some examples so you can look how practical this is, but I decided to coach my son's basketball team just so I can be in his world. He's 13, right? By the way, being in junior high's world is hilarious, right? If you, if you want to get some life in you, Probably you should do something with youth because they'll bring life out of you. It's been amazing coaching uh, his, his team at school. And it's been an awesome thing to spend more time in his world because it goes by really, really fast. And once in a while, not once in a while, but every year, implement a vacation in there. Again, why are you working so hard? To enjoy the people that are part of your life. Again, my prayer is that we have healthy, beautiful, strong families that our kids feel Blessed to be part of our lives, and we get to be part of their lives as well. Can you say amen? And then the last part that I want to talk to you about today, doing what Jesus does, is this whole concept of, of the gospel and hospitality, right? What did Jesus say to us, right? Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's a mandate, right? He didn't say pray about it. He said go, right? So if I'm a follower of Jesus, I have to be intentional about sharing the good news and about being hospitable. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. He went from place to place, sharing the good news, being hospitable, spending time with people. So what does that look like for us in a practical standpoint? For us is this, is that, you know, the heart behind our church community is that we want to be a church for the unchurch. Always thinking about someone who doesn't have the love of Jesus or doesn't have a community, right, to share uh, the things of Jesus with. So for us, the first thing, my friends, is is invite the in church to church. Be in, intentional about our week. Because we never know when a divine appointment is going to happen, right? But if I'm living with that mindset that, man, I have the gospel and someone out there doesn't, then you know what? I'm always going to be on high alert, ready to have that conversation. It could be a coworker, It could be someone at the gym. It could be someone that I met online. Listen, just always thinking. And we always say, that the heart of Jesus is to go for the one, right? Luke 15, Jesus tells us three stories of something was lost and someone went after that which was lost. The lost coin, the lost sheep, and then the lost son, right? But you have to also understand the power of that last conversation, of the last parable that Jesus told, is that in the lost son, it was supposed to be that the older brother was supposed to go after the lost brother and he didn't and Jesus was making a point about being in the church but not going after those who are outside of it so we have to be intentional my friends about inviting the church into church here's another again practical thing that all, all of us can do is be better hosts right just learning to host people at our house right because why that's what Jesus did right Jesus didn't have a place, but he would go and bring his friends into other people's houses just to have a conversation, to have a meal, to get to know them, right? Sometimes we pray for a big house and God's like, for what? Are you going to host? Are you going to be a blessing to those that might need uh, a place to come and have a good meal and have a good conversation, right? Here's another one, right? So needed right now. How about we become better listeners? Some people just need to be heard. Sometimes I work. Your co-worker is going through a hard time. Can you just pull up a chair and just say, what's going on? How are you? See, a lot of times I think God will send us people, but because we're so out of tune with him, they will dismiss it. 
It sounds like a nuisance. It sounds like we're in a hurry. It sounds like we, we, we're getting ready to go to the next thing. But my friends, we've got to slow down. The next thing is right in front of you. It's a person in need, right? So don't let it be an interruption. Let it be an assignment. Let it be a moment that you can have with someone who might just need someone to listen. We don't listen anymore. So listening to me is one of the greatest things that the people of God can bring into the world where no one else listens, right? So let's be good listeners. Let's be attentive to the need of those people around us. Because sometimes they may not come to church with us, but we can bring the church to them exactly where we are. Can you say amen? Here's another one. Pray for people. Sounds so cliche, but we know that everything God does is through prayer. I pray you go into your, your workplace and just pray for those around you. Never go to your work without praying first. Just ask the presence of God over the place where you work. Listen, by doing that, you are bringing the kingdom of God. How did Jesus say to pray? He says, pray this way. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, you can bring heaven to your place of work. Wherever you are as God's people, you can pray and bring the presence of God with you. Again, these are practical things that all of us can do, right? The, the beautiful thing about prayer is you could be praying, no one knows you're praying, right? Because you're just bringing the presence of God with you to your workplace. And what's amazing is I believe that's where co coincidences begin to happen. You begin to, to open up doors in the spirit because you're praying. You're, you're creating a place where the presence of God is felt. And when people are in need, they'll come to you because they know you pray. Isn't it amazing that, that a lot of times you think no one's paying attention to you, but then something happens, they know who to turn to. Or if you mess up, they know, oh, aren't you the one who's supposed to be a Christian? So be consistent, be prayerful, right? Pray, pray and pray over the place where you work. I believe that no matter where you work, God has you there as a representative of who he is. So represent Jesus well. Again, work like you're working for Jesus, not for men. And lastly, is we can all serve the city that God put us there for. See, one of the beautiful things about crews is that every single crew has a serve the city project. Why? Because we don't want to get together just for ourselves. We want to get together to figure out how can we bless those in our community. So when you join a crew, you're automatically going to do a serve the city project, which is really awesome because, again, the heart of Jesus is, is for you to be healthy and then for you to reach out. Because Jesus said, who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick? He says, I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. And we can all be a tangible blessing in someone's life by simply joining a crew and doing a serve the city project. I don't know if you know this, but our food pantry serves hundreds of people every single week. Why? Because... It's an extension of Jesus' heart for those who are in need around us. And we do so much uh, in this community because it's the heart of Jesus. It's the heart of God, you know. So, my friends, I hope and pray that you take seriously this call to build a trellis for your soul. Because these things are not just going to happen. They'll happen because you are intentional about creating a structure, a system, where every single week these things are happening in your life and you're implementing everything that's going to give you a healthy soul, right? From abiding all the way down to being hospitable and sharing the good news with those around you. Let's pray together today. You know, everything I talk about here only makes sense when you have decided to follow Jesus. See, Jesus put out the call. He says, come follow me and I will teach you how to fish for people. Again, come follow me is how to be like him. Fish for people is to do what he does. But everything starts when you decide, I am going to surrender my life to Jesus because I want to live according to his will. I want to follow him and I want to do what he does. So everything happens first through surrendering. You know, the word repentance simply means this. It means I change my mind. I don't want to live for me. I don't want to live according to my will. I want to live according to God's will for me through the person of Jesus. See, Jesus came to give us life and life more abundant. And he even paid the penalty for our sins so that we can have life in him. And he rose again to show us that he has the power over death, the enemy, and sin. And when you invite him into your life, you're inviting the power of God to live in you so that you can live according to his will. 
So if you've never trusted in Jesus as the Lord of your life, this is a great moment to do that. If you feel He's calling you, it's more than a prayer. See, a prayer is just the beginning. It's what you do after the prayer that says this is real, like I want to follow Jesus. So I want to lead us into this prayer, especially if you've never said yes to Jesus. And after you, you pray this prayer, if you're serious, there's going to be a number here that you can text. Why do we ask you to text this number? It's so we can connect with you because it's just the beginning. The prayer is just the beginning. The key, though, is to follow up and truly become part of God's people, which is the church. So let's pray together if that's you. Just open your heart to Him. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Lord of your life, He will come into your life and rescue you. A better word for salvation is rescue. You need rescuing, right? You don't need a a motivational speaker. You need a Savior. You can't save yourself. Jesus came to save us from ourselves, from our sins. So pray with me and say, Jesus, today I'm ready to surrender my life to you. I'm ready to repent, to change my mind on how I'm living. I want to live in your will. I want to live in your purpose. I want to be a follower of Jesus, and I want to be someone who does what Jesus does. And so fill me today, Jesus, with your Holy Spirit, for I want to live in the fullness of your will. I want to trust you. I want to live according to the principles that you set out for me. And I pray today in your name, Jesus. Amen. See, if you pray that prayer, I believe the old is gone, the new has come. But like I said, the prayer is just the beginning. Right? Text this number, let's connect, let's talk, let's get you on the, right, uh, on the right journey here with the will of God. So thankful that we got to spend this time together. May God bless you and your family mightily and we'll see you soon. All on the altar Surrendered again Freely I lay down My everything This is my honor The gift that I bring And I will be a living sacrifice All my heart and soul to glorify I offer nothing less than all my life For Jesus Christ And I will be a living sacrifice All my heart and soul to glorify I offer nothing less than all my life For Jesus Christ And I will be a living sacrifice All my heart and soul to glorify I offer nothing less than all my life For Jesus Christ